Thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, coming to you from the cozy comforts of our palatial homes. I'm Max's next door neighbor, Brian Hoyle, and your host for the evening, they're here, your busy backyard bartenders, the masters of the takeout menu, the homeschooling, home distancing, Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And what do you know? We continue our quarantine episodes, but this episode is bringing to you a positivity podcast. Yes, this is for everyone that wants to feel good while uh, staying at home, keeping tight, keeping close in quarters. But uh, we've heard some doom and gloom, and we've heard people kind of throwing their hands up in the air going, what is next? What do we do? And, you know, Matt and I are fairly connected into this food and beverage industry here in North Carolina, and we have a lot of great people giving us conversations and inspiration and thoughts as to how they're getting through it. And we figured it would be nice to just uh, shine the light. We have four people set up to speak with us on the show, and uh, it'll be kind of like talk show style. We'll, uh, we'll bring out our first big guest. But Matt, let's, uh, let's not waste any time. Who do we have up first? Yeah, so the first person who really inspired me and to hear some positivity and stuff about moving forward was former guest of the show, a former collaborator, the tribe's very own and Snap P's very own, Jacob Bohm. Welcome <laughs> hey. in, Jacob. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Uh, Jacob, I wanted to bring you in because you did a couple of amazing things, or at least I thought that was amazing. And I just wanted to talk about what you're doing with Snap P and then the fact just close to my heart is... Uh, you took it upon yourself uh, to cook Passover Seder dinner for what? What was it? Fifty? What was it fifty meals? Something like that? It a, yeah, it was about sixty mouths that I uh, cooked food for. Sixty mouths, and uh, you did it all very much social distance, distancing under the social distancing umbrella. People picked up or got delivered. Uh, staying six feet apart. It was a traditional meal and with your usual wonderful touch, it was really delicious and then hosted a virtual Seder. Uh, so when you uh, are ready, just chat about why you did that, what's going on with your employees and what's going on with Snap P and how you uh, decided to move your business through these times. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is it's such uncertain times for everyone and, you know, there's sort of we've, all these businesses have gone through waves you know, the first way of being how can we operate and do so safely, making changes. Uh, then many businesses, Snap P included, have, you know, decided to at least temporarily sort of suspend operations. And at that point, you pivot to saying, well, how can we keep customers happy? How can we reduce food loss to make the best of it? Um, so, you know, for us, that meant uh, looking at the inventory of food that we had from the canceled pop up and saying, what of this can we donate? And of the stuff that we can't donate to pe- folks in need, how can we find you know people who will appreciate or enjoy that food so that nothing is wasted? And making sure that customers are taken care of. That means giving refunds, even though that hurts the hurts the the, the wallet. Um, and I think the important piece of that is if you can pitch to your customers, you know we'll give you a refund. But if you don't need it, then you don't need to take it. We can use a credit for the future. And we had so many people who were like, yeah, totally. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Well, we can't wait to come back later. I've seen that as a model happening. And that's, that's a really cool thing. Like, you know, eventually, like, it's almost like a gift card. Eventually, like you can, you can cash in on that, but people are cash poor right now. So having those funds right now are very helpful. Totally. And, and even if you can add some perks, like for us, you guys know, our tickets sell really quickly. So being able to say, hey, we'll give you a credit at future and you'll get advanced booking with that credit. And so that's actually that's worth something for a future pop up. Yeah. Just for reference, if you guys don't know, Jacob, his pop up sell out in like four minutes or less. Yeah, we're very we're very lucky. So after we got that sort of like initial uh, shock taken care of, then it became a matter of saying, hey, how can we see this as a gift this time? What projects have we been putting off that we can work on finally? Uh, What can we do to improve Snappy so that when we do open our doors, we're uh, up and running? Um, And so that was stuff like organization stuff on the back end, admin, marketing, those kinds of things that we can really start to invest in using this time as a gift that we don't normally have this amount of time to do that. Yep. Um, With, from there, the question became once as we started to wrap those projects up, it became it was really important for me to continue to support my team. And so I'm really proud 
to say that all of our core team is still being paid our salary people at their full salaries and our uh, hourly folks at a portion of what they would have been making uh, for this season, doing what, basically what we can to help help those employees because, you know, they still need to pay rent. They still need to feed themselves and snap is nothing without them. So we want to do what we can to help them. And then from there, sort of pivoting to say, what can we do to use what we have to help the community? And that's sort of where, how can we use our our skills, our platform? Uh, and so the passive versator you mentioned, that was more of a personal thing, less of a sort of snappy business. I, uh, I love hosting Jewish celebrations in my home for my friends and community. And uh, I was bummed that I wasn't going to be able to do that for Passover. So I said, how can I, how can we translate this to the current situation? So I said, well, hell, I'm going to still make the delicious food that I was going to. I'm still going to support all the local farms that I would have been buying that stuff from. And I've got time on my hands. I'll go around and I'll deliver it or people can pick it up if they want. And then uh, we'll do a virtual Zoom Seder and we can sort of come together in the community however we can, despite the restrictions. Could you tell us what was something that you made for the Seder? Yeah. So, I mean, the Seder, for those who aren't familiar with it, sort of has two components. It has one, which is the sort of like traditional Seder plate, which are different symbolic foods. Uh, And then it has sort of what they call the festive meal. And I thought that at this particular moment in time, when there's so much change, there's so much new in the world, uh, that uh, I wanted to go in a more traditional direction because I thought it might be grounding, it might be comforting, it might be a way to sort of feel sort of safe, feel sort of comfortable. And so for the meal, we did beautiful pasture-raised brisket that came from first firsthand foods, which I braised with uh, green garlic and some smoked tomatoes that we had preserved from last summer. And then serve that really simply with some uh, roasted the local organic sweet potatoes, first of the season asparagus, and matzo ball soup with local pasture-raised chicken uh, that we had uh, saved up scraps and backs and wings and stuff from uh, events over the course of the year. Yum. Yeah, so. I, I have to say the brisket was unbelievable. And I know we have uh, Jake Wood from Lawrence Barbecue coming on later. We might have to do like a taste off of uh, of your guys' uh, <laughs> briskets because it's wildly different, like the smoke, whole smoke brisket versus what the braised brisket kind of that you did. But um, those were both delicious. And I definitely want to taste those side by side. Is that just is that just a way that you can get more brisket? Is that an excuse to just have someone yeah, cook some brisket? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I think I'm going to need to try that again <laughs> yeah, for uh, so. for a taste off. It's uh, critical. I'm, for I'm just I'm not sure. I don't know who could do it better. You know, yeah. right? They'll take a quart <laughs> of mac and together. cheese too. Better taste that. Too. Yeah, <laughs> better taste that. Um, hey, Jacob, I, I'm wondering, uh, and I also before we let you out of here, I want to talk about the. Um, the, you, you also hosted the cook along with Southwind product produce boxes as, as another way to stimulate some business. But I just, I have to think that people who are listening to this are thinking, well, wow, that's amazing. You paid your people during this. Like, how did you manage to do that? Yeah, it's sort of a couple fold. I mean, the first thing is as part of the business plan, have a snappy emergency fund. So that is money that we save. Uh, it doesn't get spent unless we're in a sort of emergency situation. And that allows us to refund people's tickets if a pop-up gets canceled because of rain. It allows us to have the flexibility because we're, it's a pretty risky endeavor in terms of some of the choices we're making. It's really important to have a financial cushion there. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. Um, but that certainly wasn't enough to be able to carry a payroll through potentially three, four months of global pandemic. Uh, and so it's also required me to dip into my savings. Um, that's wow. personal savings. Uh, and it's just that important for me to take care of my uh, employees to do that. And I don't take that for granted that I can do that. And I don't judge anyone who is not able to do that, but it's something that I'm able to do. And and if this is not a moment for us to each do what we can do, then what are we doing? Do you have like a, like a regiment of, of how you save? I mean, I know it sounds like this isn't like a, a money podcast, but I mean, do you have like a, a way of going about it? Like, do you take 10% of everything you earn and put it in a way? Is there like a, a, a method to your madness that could help kind of figure it out for others that are struggling during trying to figure out this time? Max is yeah. asking for a friend. Yeah, just for a friend. <laughs> yeah. How do you do this? I think doing, I think doing, uh, I, I wish that I had a specific uh, regimen, but basically every year I look at my finances and say, what, what do I feel like I can put away that will allow Snappy to continue operating as is? It'll allow me to live a safe, comfortable life, uh, allow me to pay my employees well. And then what, what's sort of left there? And I think if you can set goals for yourself, like, you know, what would it say, what would it mean to set 10% of profits aside uh, into an emergency fund? I think that'd be uh, really great. 
I have to think that going forward, businesses are going to start to think that way and do something like an emergency fund. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the Southwind box because I think one of the important thought processes in this moment is I think at the beginning of this COVID, we all had this idea that like this is a sprint and we're scrambling and how are we going to, you know, everyone was pivoting immediately. How can we make this work? Uh, and I think we're starting to realize that this is a marathon. This is going to last. Even once things start to reopen, you're not going to have as many seats at your restaurant. You're not going to be able to do the same scale. People might still be a, a little bit hesitant to leave or engage in different ways. And so I think it's important to use this time that we have on our hands to say, what is reopening going to look like? And before we reopen, how can we pivot in a sustainable way? How can we maintain what we're doing as opposed to just sort of like brace ourselves in the fetal position until this is all over? Um, and so uh, one of the ideas that we came up with was partnering with one of the local sustainable farms uh, that we work with regularly with our pop-ups and catering, uh, Southwind Produce, Miles and Angie up in Rougemont, um, who do absolutely, I mean, they grow beautiful produce. And thinking about this idea that right now people are looking for new ways to get groceries, particularly fresh produce. Farmers are still producing all this. You know, it's not like COVID yeah. has stopped farms from, you know, has stopped uh, plants from growing. So they're still growing all this produce. In many cases, farmers markets have been shut down because those are seen as events as opposed to sort of grocery stores. Um, and then the third, the sort of third leg of this tripod is that there's a lot of people who aren't used to cooking all this fresh produce themselves. They don't necessarily know what to do with it. They don't know how to use different ingredients. And, and then there's people who are looking for ways to have community to bring uh, people together to connect with other people. And so we thought, well, how could Snappy work to sort of connect those different dots? And what we came up with was this live weekly cook along where basically um, you buy a ticket for your household or your family. You get a box of beautiful produce, which is delivered to your doorstep. And then uh, that night, uh, we host a live cook along where you log on. You've gotten the recipes in advance. You've got an equipment list. You know what's in that bag. And then there's a live video stream of me basically walking you through cooking all that stuff. Uh, obviously, there's a whole internet full of cooking videos, uh, but this is a little bit different because you're cooking right alongside uh, a chef. Yeah. If you have questions, you can ask those questions. If you're like, well, I don't know if I need to add more water to the <laughs> rice, you know, you can say, well, what's going on? Let's see. Do you need to? Uh, and then uh, afterwards, sit down and uh, sort of enjoy our meal together. Uh, sort of like we did at the Passover Seder um, to be able to help bridge some of that community together. I really That's love cool. that idea. That is like so inclusive and helpful. It's like online school, but you get the benefit of seeing friends and people that you respect, but then also you have an end result of delicious food at the end. And you literally like, it's the old proverb, right? You taught a man to fish, you taught a person how to cook, <laughs> which really is really right. helpful right now. Yeah. yeah, and then hopefully, hopefully they'll still come back with the pop-ups. They're not just like, well, now I know all the tricks. Oh, no. That, <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, what supersedes the ability or want to cook is the ability to be taken care of. And I think <laughs> we will always be coming back to both uh, Snap Pea and to restaurants in general, because why not? That's It's fun. It's entertainment, too. It's not just sustenance. It's the thing that we're missing right now is the camaraderie and being able to hang out. I think that's a, you know, we put a, po a post up on our uh, story and I just like, we were just asking like, you know, when this uh, actual quarantine is lifted and however it might actually go, will people's instincts be, you know, if Governor Cooper says in four days, everything will be reopened. What is everyone's thought right then? Do you immediately go out to restaurants? Do you take precaution? Do you still stay home and quarantine until you feel it's right? When we got the poll back on our question, the majority of people, I think it was like 40% of the people said they're going to go directly back to restaurants. But then mm. the second most uh, was... I will still wear a mask and gloves in public, but I I will go out. And then the least put on there was I'm going to stay in and, and keep quarantining, though it still was about like 10 percent of people yeah. that answered the question. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the important thing to remember is like there's not going to be an end. It's not going to be like and now coronavirus yeah. is huh? not a thing. Um, it's public health like these things ripple through. Uh, and so it'll be important not only for individuals to con continue to consider the ways that they can 
help to uh, slow the spread, but also we have a responsibility as businesses, as people who are uh, creating spaces for people to come together. We have a responsibility to continue to uh, support those efforts and saying, just because we can open doesn't mean we should immediately go back to how things were. Maybe we take some precautions in different ways uh, to make sure that we're all sort of doing our part here. Yeah, it's about uh, you're gonna you're gonna eventually have to make a decision yourself of like what percentage of risk are you comfortable with because there's still gonna be a risk. There, it's exactly like you said, it's never gonna be okay. It's now zero percent chance that you can you can be infected by the coronavirus. That's n- almost never gonna happen. So, and it will be a long time as we know before there's there is a, um, a, 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 a an antibody or something that can cure it or a vaccine, but, uh, but hopefully the risks will be very much minimized. But uh, yeah. Jacob, before you get out of here, just let us know if somebody wants to join along with your cook along, how they can go about and do that. Just follow us on social media at SnapPNC or head to our website to join our mailing list, snappnc.com. Sign up. Uh, we'll, we actually haven't publicly announced this, so that'll be going live later today. I'm not sure when this episode is going to air. But uh, it'll be going live today for uh, Saturday's cook along, and uh, then we'll be doing it every week after that. So feel free to pop in for one week or every week, however however you want to do Sounds it. Sounds awesome. Yeah, I, we plan to do it. You, the Trujillos are gonna are gonna be a part of this uh, cook along this weekend, which will be really fun. So I hope to see everybody else there too. And I believe this episode was is dropping this week, prob- probably on Thursday. So if uh, if they haven't already sold out, and I don't know how that means if if there is a sellout or does it. Could you, in theory, well, there, just keep it, going? Yeah, I mean, uh, Southwind does have a limited num- amount of produce to sell, just like at a farmer's market, they might sell out. Uh, so they've, the past couple of weeks, uh, just selling their own boxes to their own people, they have sold out. So we do anticipate that it'll sell out, but the cutoff will be uh, Thursday uh, at midnight if it is not sold out. So just keep that in mind. Awesome. Well, Jacob, thank you for doing all that you do. We really appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. Up next, we will have Chef Jake Wood. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thanks for having me, guys. So I want to give a, a little bit of a shout out to the Folks Foundation, the champions of all good things crafted in North Carolina and the folks that make them. And check it out. There's something new that they're doing. They are producing a compilation vinyl album. Yeah, like a record, like a real spinning record called the Carolina Quarantine Project, where Carolina-based musicians and duos showcase songs written while sheltered in place. Pre-sales for the vinyl album start May 1st and will be released in June, and all sales go directly to the artists. Some of the artists that are featured are Couldn't Be Happier's, Migrant Birds, Stray Local, Ghosts of Liberty, Neville's Quarter, and His and Hers. So check them out. Follow them on Instagram at Folks Foundation, or check them out online at folksfoundation.org. Remember, they are champions of all good things crafted in North Carolina and the folks that make them. Folks Foundation. Well, up next, we have a chef who was on the brink of opening his first restaurant after working at the well-known Raleigh businesses such as Raleigh Raw, The Cowfish, Plates, 18 Seaboard. We have Chef Jake Wood on the line who opened Lawrence Barbecue in an unusual way. Jake, welcome to the show. Tell us how you pivoted from your original opening and what you're doing now. Yeah, first off, thank, thanks for having me on. I hope you guys are having a good morning on this nasty, nasty Monday. But um, so we, you know, we've been, this is something I've been working on for quite some time. You know, something that I talked a lot about with Jason Smith and got a lot of, a lot of direction from him while I was at 18 Seaboard. And when we left Plates, it was time for us to start this thing. You know, originally in our LOI, we were set to open in the beginning of summer, late spring. So that got pushed off. And then we got, you know, a good schedule of pop-ups going. We got a good schedule of cater, catering events over the next few months. And, you know, when this hit, uh, we got back from, from Charleston Wine and Food. And it just kind of started to hit when we were there. Actually, the very first case in Charleston came in on the very last day we were there for the festival. And so we didn't really, you know, it wasn't kind of something we were thinking about at the time. Then we got back home and it just, you know, it was like a... a outbreak you know it seemed like so um we had to switch gears due to the fact that all of our catering got canceled we had to give some refunds back on deposits um which is you know obviously that's on us to take care of but it hurt us a little bit um in in the situation that we're in taking care of the the, the things that we we need to take care of as far as payroll as far as you know continuing forward building this thing out so we decided to switch gears uh with with 
you know, serving our community at the front of our minds, especially the food and beverage community who, who are suddenly out of jobs. That's really important to me. And, and obviously, you know, I've got a family and, and kids. And so those two things kind of drive what we're doing. You know, we, we've gotten busier as the weeks have gone on doing curbside. And um, to be quite honest with you, it was a very hard decision to make because, you know, we've had, we, we just have such high expectations and have set such high expectations for ourselves in this concept and this food. And we never imagined rolling it out in a curbside capacity. But uh, we're very proud of what we're, what we're doing, what we've been able to do. We've got a small smoker that's not meant to feed the city. It's tough to keep up. But, <clears throat> you know, that's all driving us being able to feed folks every Monday. And, and people can call on Monday uh, and place the order for pickup on Thursday, you know, whatever. We just want to give folks the opportunity and the option for uh, – uh, they, they know where one meal is coming from each week if they so please. We're here for them. Now, your location is not where your actual Lawrence Barbecue location was going to be. Is that right? No, not at all, actually. Uh, we're over here hanging out with the Killjoy fellas um, as they finish their interior in here. Uh, the kitchen is obviously, you know, from the Saul 116 setup. So we were able to, to get in here in February and start using it as a commissary for our catering, for R&D, for our, our new menu, uh, pop-up preps, stuff like that. Um, we've got refrigeration and everything here, prep space, dish machine. So it was it was a really good deal we had worked out over here with these guys. Um, and then this happened. And so, you know, we spoke with them, made sure we had their their good graces, and we moved forward, man. We took a couple of days. We completely sanitized the kitchen, cleaned it from, from top to bottom, uh, got all new product in. And, um, you know, we've kind of just been rolling ever since then, man. You know, it makes me think of like inspiration for people that uh, think about all those people that want to open a restaurant that are line cooks or, you know, front of the house managers. And they got this great idea and this concept right now, as we speak, there are so many closed restaurants with kitchens that are not being used. And what better way to like create like a takeout startup business or something with very low risk. And I just love that, you know, you're, you were ready to open up in your own place and I'll have you tell us where that is. And also we'll, so we can get excited for that when it happens but like just thinking about it you're like man we we gotta we gotta pay some bills we gotta make some money and we we gotta get out there how proactive of you to do this and just say screw it where can we go what can we do i applaud you for doing that man and i really hope more people do that not too many people or else you know maybe there won't be enough people to buy some lawrence barbecue i'm just kidding (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, it, like I said, it was a difficult decision, but we've got the space. We feel we still feel safe, feel healthy. So, you know, as long as we can continue to operate clean, safe, healthy for both us and for our customers, we're going to be here doing it. And, and we just want to make sure that we're here and we're an option for this community right now because um, we've had a lot of folks, which we really, really appreciate. And it kind of reminds us why we do this. We've had a lot of folks reach out and just say, hey, thank you so much for a little bit of normalcy this evening, you know, uh, we were able to come and get some great takeout and go have a family meal and have to worry about anything. And, 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 you know, that there's that side of it. And then obviously the side of it for us providing meals to folks in need right now. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to ask for help. And so we just want to let everyone know as many times a day as we can that we're here. You know, if we are here in this kitchen, even if we're not, man, call the phone, we got you, we'll help you. If we can't, we will link you with somebody who can. And that's what I think, uh, you know, if I had a message to give to anybody in this community or, or past, past this community, uh, you know, just just offer up what you can. You know, that, that's it. I think that would go so far with with folks in the community who are in need um, and, and also folks who, who have the means to provide, uh, whether that be a service or whether that be funds to donate, whatever it may be. Uh, do what you can. Be safe about it. Uh, that's kind of the message that we are trying to um, to show in our work here, what we're doing. Yeah, man. Uh, it, it was pretty cool. On Friday afternoon, uh, the good folks over at Raleigh Magazine, who we uh, work with all the time, and I write an article for her all the time, and the Kraken, who writes and does our social media, she uh, she's a writer there. Uh, you were you gave a live demonstration of how you make your mac and cheese. And, yeah, that was fun. 
You know what was really cool about that, at least uh, what was happening here at the uh, the Trujillo household, which also kind of doubles as the Hoyle household. Household because Brian Hoyle, the the voice of our show, is my absolute next door neighbor. So we've been awesome. kind of quarantining as two families next door to each other, and we had all the kids playing in a in a makeshift uh, inflatable pool outside, and I put one of our big screens out in front and just threw up you cooking live and the kids were watching you make mac and cheese which i thought was awesome awesome. and they were like totally into it because i think they need outside stimulus as much as anyone too so of course they're like yeah man uh what talk to me about the cheese that you're using because i i've never used that cheese in in a mac boris so yeah borson cheese man i love that stuff it's like you can eat it with a spoon it's so good it's a gourmet cheese and this is a blend of garlic and herbs um it's very soft spreadable cheese you can temper it a little bit at room temperature um and it makes it even more spreadable uh one thing i mentioned on there i love doing is just making some good toast like you know pick up some fresh rye bread from a bakery uh local bakery <clears throat> and get toast that thing up Spread some of that on there with some fresh avocado, lime juice, sea salt, cilantro. It is like drugs, man. <laughs> um, so we we kind of let let that uh, blend in last and and you know do its thing. Touch up that that kind of I guess you could say plain cheese sauce flavor and just give it a little something else. That's the third cheese, um, and you know it, it, it gives it a little rich, creamy uh, finish on the back of the tongue. So. We really like it. We're going to we're going to use it, um, you know, in multiple different spots in the restaurant. I think we're going to have a starter. We're going to try to do some pimento borsa cheese, which I've always wanted to try. Um, But, man, next time you're at the store and you see it, grab one. I think they have another flavor. It might be roasted red pepper or something, but it's a gourmet cheese, borsa, white and green package. Uh, I will gladly take take sponsorship from uh, from borsa if they would like like to. I'll I'll advertise for them. It's that good. (laughs) Yeah. Hashtag hey, what, free cheese. <laughs> hey, before we get you out of here, uh, two questions. If you are uh, a hospitality unemployed now or furloughed or laid off uh, worker, uh, you simply just call your business when you're open and say, hey, man, can I get a meal? Or And that's how it works. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So we try to uh, control it just a little bit and we take all the orders on Monday. Um, so call us anytime. Anytime we're open on the hotline on Monday. Okay. Uh, you can pick it up on Monday as early as 20 minutes from the time you call, or you can place it for later that day, later that week. Uh, that being said, what I've been telling people is, is like I said, if we're here and we're cooking, the fire is lit, we will provide you with a meal. Don't hesitate. Call us. We got you. It doesn't matter if it's Monday, uh, Saturday, I will get up off my couch and come over here and cook you a meal. So uh, we just we just want to be here for everyone. And, and uh, that's kind of what one of the things we we really stand for and care a lot about with the concept of Lawrence and, and the roots of that. So uh, we're here. Call us Barbecue Paradise Hotline. We'll get you squared up with a hot meal. That's awesome, man. Thank you for doing that. Because I, as Max has talked about before on the couple of past episodes, there's a lot of uh, hospitality workers that you wouldn't think about, but they, they don't have any income right now and they're struggling a little bit. So they need to be fed. For sure. And then for other days of the week, uh, our friend G's got hope for hospitality going on. And you can go, uh, you can find that online and you can actually sign up for meals every day of the week from a different place. I know Dice is involved, uh, Edwards Mill Bar and Grill. I know Cantina 18 did a Taco Tuesday. Um, we've, we've got, we're doing our thing on Monday. So we're also doing that on Monday. So there's a couple different ways that you can link up with us and, and other folks in the community and get what you need. And I think that's great. I would love to think in the time of need that I could do the same thing and my family could, per, you know, kind of rely on some help like that in the community. So, um, that's come awesome. on, let us feed you. Uh, we love you guys, Riley. And, and we're just, we're here for you always now and always. So, I'm looking forward to this this year. It's going to be a big year once we get past this. Uh, we're opening up in the new box yard out in RTP yeah. with uh, Full Steam. We've got bulgogi, mm-hmm. car burritos. You know, there's going to be a wine bar, a CBD uh, situation out there, live music. So it's going to be really cool, man. We're we're very excited and we're we're very uh, honored to be able to to share what we've been working on with with this community. Well, that sounds awesome in itself, but. I mean, in this time, that sounds super uber awesome. One last question for you. Will you be willing once we get out of this quarantine to have a brisket cook-off versus Jacob Bohm, who does, I don't know if you heard a traditional, (laughs) uh, like almost uh, braised brisket style. Very different from a smoker. (laughs) 
I would love to, man. I would also love to just try that and, and just sit down and eat some of that. I'll, that sounds <laughs> yeah. delicious. Yeah, I don't um, think it needs to actually... be a competition. I think we can just all enjoy some brisket here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Just have a have a brisket party, man. I think that's that's uh, we should, something to look forward to when all this gets back to normal, man. Just a brisket block block party. Matter of fact, I was talking to uh, my buddy Spencer, who is with Cowboy Cauldron, and I think I've actually ordered a Cowboy Cauldron, and due to all this, it's not here yet. I uh, spoke with him yesterday, and we're going to plan on having some type of a cowboy cauldron, Lawrence, barbecue, anybody else open to collab. We're, we're open to uh, block party, man. Hopefully this summer um, mm. we can do briskets. We can do all types of stuff, have kids doing marshmallows on the open cauldrons. Um, so that might be an opportunity for a brisket party, man. <laughs> brisket block party. I love it. That sounds awesome, man. Jake, thank you so much, man. You're welcome to hang on the line, but we're going to take a quick moment for another commercial break and, uh, and then speak with our next guest. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Take love care. You guys. Thanks, Jake. Well, so I'll take this time to talk about something that is very important at this time, as uh, chef Jake just mentioned, takeout. And for some of you that have businesses that maybe are not taking advantage of that revenue stream in normal times or in this time, and you need a little help getting your platform platform off the ground, there's eHungry.com and eHungry.com will set up everything for you as far as your internet platform. And all they do is take 1.9% of the sales that you've generated from your food. And if you sign up, 30 days are automatically free, but if you use the NCFB promo code or just tell them you heard about them on the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, you will get 60 days free. That's right, 60 days free. Again, they set up everything for you. All you have to do is cook the food, package it, deliver it, but they set up all the technology for you. So eHungry.com, go enhance your revenue and make your takeout business easy. And next we're bringing in from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but you, uh, as a listener, might have known him best or most famously as your favorite employee of the former Nana's uh, as he worked there and then transitioned to Hawthorne and Wood over in Chapel Hill. He's probably going to lord this over his chef's head as uh, now Neil Benefield be on the North Carolina Food and Beverage podcast before Chef Brandon Sharp as we had... uh, Recorded chef in studio, one of the last guests we had in studio before we were all quarantined. But Neil, tell us about how you and Hawthorne uh, pivoted your whole business model to be sustainable and quarantine friendly. Sure, sure. So yeah, that um, those two issues were uh, were on the forefront of what we were trying to do. As um, you know, social responsibility is, is certainly even more important now than ever, I would think. But at Hawthorne and Wood, we've always had a commitment to uh, focus, precision, clarity, and grace. Those are our pillars, our core values. And we needed to make sure that we could do this in a way that um, you know, not only represented our brand, but also uh, gave back to the community or at least shared with the community so that they could still enjoy the quality of our product uh, in a way that, that, that we felt um, we're still putting our best foot forward. So you know, takeout was something that we we never did before, only on a very rare occasion. Uh, we just didn't really feel that it um, represented our food as perfectly as possible. So we had to make sure that we did something more precise and more focused. And, and in doing so, you know, we got ahead of the game a little bit. We we shut our, our in-house dining down about two days before the government shut down and really had some hard conversations and, and thought long and deeply about what would look best um, and what would still be responsible. So we started doing our uh, our dinner for one, our dinner for two. It's three course packages, and just completely streamlined the menu so that you know we were cutting a lot of the loss or we wouldn't have a lot of waste, and then still just really focusing and honing in on those dishes to make them as as delicious and as beautiful as possible in the takeout model. Yeah, I mean, I've got to yeah. say. High quality food or fine dining or whatever you want to call it. I just let them call it high quality food because everything's great and you can eat wherever you want. But high quality food, which is what you guys are doing and places like the Umstead or Second Empire or just, you know, Postmaster. I feel they're struggling the hardest because who feels like I got to go out and get myself a really fancy steak or or some fish that's so delicately prepared and all. And so I feel the I feel the worst for those that have been doing the hardest work 
in, in, in previous, you know, uh, inceptions. And so uh, I feel like the fine dining aspect of it is, is critical to how it rebounds in the future. So I, I love that you guys are figuring out a way to still sustain what you're doing, but in a, in a viable sense and being able to get it from you all. I mean, do you, do you feel that specifically about being in fine dining? Um, absolutely. You know, we'll, we'll always have our double cheeseburger on the menu. And when we first pivoted to this model, I think we were seeing probably uh, 20 to 35 cheeseburgers go out on our busy nights. And now because people are, are getting used to what we're doing and the consistency with our email blast, and having the online ordering system, we're seeing that shift that now people are, are coming in probably at a 90% rate for the three course dinners. And we're seeing less of the cheeseburgers go out. Wow. Um, that's not to say that, you know, the cheeseburger isn't fantastic and you shouldn't get it, which you absolutely should if you haven't, but you uh, just add it on to your three course meal. Yeah, absolutely. Add it on <laughs> or get it as the entree in your three course meal. But right. I, I think that at first people were just, you know, they, they didn't really know what to expect or know what would still be open. And I think now we can offer, you know, somewhat of a sense of normalcy where you can still have the kind of food that you would enjoy on your Friday night out or your Saturday night out. But in the comfort of your own home. And, and that's what Hawthorne and Wood is really trying to deliver so that, you know, we still have, you know, something to do for ourselves and something that we can feel proud of that we're putting out to the community. And what I like the fact that you guys are doing is uh, if you haven't signed up for Hawthorne and Wood's emails, you should, because they are these, this poetic description of the ingredients you're using in the menu and the, the, the courses for the evening and you change it every single day um, and, and the, the email is so well written and it really highlights and discusses the ingredients. Uh, and, and I just applaud that because in this time, you know, it's easy for people to just sit back and maybe do nothing or, you know, or, or go to some even simple model, but you guys really took the approach of being like, we're going to do something that, like you said, Max is viable, but, but easy, easy to somewhat easy to execute. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Chef is, uh, is really honed in on, on making that something that's, um, you know, enriching and, and, and fun. I get emails daily from people who say that they're looking forward to that every morning and they can't wait to see what, what we have and what we're offering. And something that's, uh, that's always been important to us is that, that we're telling a story with our food and with our wine. And Chef makes it really enjoyable for me in this new model to, to have precision on the daily menu. You know, we'll have a menu that's inspired by the flavors of Provence. And then I get to choose some wine pairings that make sense with that salad cuisine. Or, you know, for example, we had the Catalonian gazpacho and then scallops over saffron rice calispera, which automatically I'm thinking, all right, we're going to the Iberian Peninsula. What, what can we do wine wise with that? And to really target those wine pairings so that, you know, we, we can't be in somebody's house cultivating a guest experience, but we can still, you know, give them as much of the experience that Hawthorne Wood likes to give but, you know, within the parameters of what we're allowed to do now. You know, you're listening to this episode being released on April 23rd, and that's essentially just two weeks away from what many in this industry, in this local area that I happen to know when I was a general manager, as to being the busiest weekend of the year. We're talking about Mother's Day. And we're talking about all the graduations of all the major universities and even in the high schools in the area. This was a time where when I was at Midtown Grill, uh, if we averaged, say, five thousand dollars a night on that weekend, we were doing more like twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a night. And so, just for people to understand the impact of what what money is being left on the table, it, it's it's staggering. I know anybody listening to this that also runs a restaurant is like, "Thanks a lot, Max, for bringing that up." <laughs> But the thing that I'm trying to stress, for one, that was always the wildest weekend. It was kind of like, oh, shit, this is going to suck, but also be amazing. Um, this is not going away. Mother's Day is not canceled. There's so many anniversaries, such as mine. My 15-year wedding anniversary and 20-year of knowing my wife is on May 7th. And so, like... All this stuff is happening. We still need to celebrate. We still need to take care of ourselves and have date nights and be healthy human beings and respect each other, look at each other in the eye and say, this is important to me. I want to have a great bottle of wine with a great made meal. And so I think places like what you're doing, like there are very few that are available to get something that is fantastic. And, and why not? So do you guys, have you already discussed what you're going to do for that weekend and, and what we could expect just for those that want to celebrate like a fancy meal? 
Well, not necessarily, but now I'm going to. Yeah, you better get, get on it. You're two weeks away. <laughs> uh, well, if, if it was the old reality, yeah, we, we certainly would have already had a, a very clear and concise plan in place and probably an incredibly full reservation book. But um, we, our leadership made a decision very, very early on in this crisis that we weren't going to lament what we had and we weren't going to um, really try to wonder too hard about what could be in the, you know, the future, the new, new reality but we're just going to try to to do what we can day by day to make what we're doing here and now as great as possible, as um, true to the Hawthorne and Wood brand as possible, and to make sure that we're not going to feel sorry for ourselves about about missing out. Now, with that being said, I I would 100% believe that we're going to do something pretty epic for Mother's Day and and Grad Weekend, even though you know there wouldn't be much of a graduation. But our Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays have been a lot of fun since we've started. Uh, this new model, and and I and I expect it to continue, if this reality is still what we're having to do throughout that weekend. I will say on on a personal note that it'll be my first birthday weekend in twelve years in this area that I won't have to work a graduation <laughs> weekend. Um, so uh, silver linings are are abound, and I'm pretty excited about that. Happy birthday to you coming up. May uh, 9th, yes. May I make a uh, suggestion, though, for all of those uh, parents or grandparents that normally would have taken the whole family out for uh, one of those meals, and you know, maybe someone's listening that is that that person that normally drops the the big Amex at the end and pick, picks up the whole tab. Perhaps if you want to do something nice for your family, and they're all scattered in the various homes around the triangle around North Carolina, maybe you could place multiple orders and have those all delivered to your friends' homes and your family's homes so that you're all eating the same meal together and then do a live Zoom chat and enjoy, but at least know that like you took care of your family, you got like uh, the cousins and the nieces and, and you know the grandkids all taken care of all at once, and maybe you could all just buy something from Hawthorne and Wood and take it all there. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds like a commercial, but I think that's something that's real. Like You should do that. Uh, I'll make sure there's plenty of champagne available too. I promise you nice. that. And and I also understand that though there's already a hankering for some cremini mushroom soup, which is apparently already legendary on your menu. And one last thing I wanted to ask you: Does the menu is it basically what is available to you through your vendors at this time? Is that how it's going? How how um, vendor relationship at this time? Well, we've had we've had to adjust based on you know supply chain and. and you know, the new delivery days and the, the inability to get certain produce and meats. But the menu, um, same as what we did in, in, the, in the old normal, is really try to flow with the seasons and find what, what is the best produce, what are the best proteins we can get, and how can we put them together in a really interesting and, and focused way. So uh, the chefs work tirelessly on that and to make sure that, you know, that we're, we're, getting, we're getting Hawthorne and Wood quality products, but we're also putting it into a menu that makes sense for the takeout model. So I, I would say that that's probably the two things that are factoring in the most into, into what we're doing. And it has been a lot of fun seeing, you know, a different menu every day and the challenges in executing that. And I, I think it's been a lot of fun for the back of the house team to not just be executing, you know, the, the menu that we had for the week before we had to shut down, but they get to see a new soup every day or a new salad every day or a new um, protein preparation every day, new desserts every day. And even though, you know, some of it are things that we're drawing from our old menu, I, I think it takes some of the routine out of what this could have been for, for our restaurant. That's fantastic, man. Neil, uh, we really appreciate it. And yeah, as Matt alluded to, uh, for the listeners, uh, stay tuned. I believe probably in the following week, we'll do our episode that we recorded pre-quarantine with Chef Brandon Sharp, who was so knowledgeable, just affable, uh, man, well-spoken. And the guy is a, a supreme talent. So uh, it's a refreshing listen to uh, especially hear things that weren't all about quarantine at the time, because we do know that this is only temporary and things may look different as the future goes, but it's still uh, the reason why things will go back to whatever normal is, is because we want it to be there and we're all going to struggle. We're going to work hard to make it as normal as possible in the, in the coming months. So uh, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and chatting with us and giving us all an opportunity uh, for a new food outlet if we didn't already know. So thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate you putting me on first because he would be a very, very difficult act to follow. So <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> well, well said. So uh, we'll take a quick break. 
But before we do, we're going to talk about Triangle Wine Company because they're a great company that does awesome retail all around the Triangle from Cary to Morrisville to Southern Pines and Holly Springs. Uh, they sell out, they sell beer, they sell wine, they sell proof alcohol ice cream, and they're good friends that support the podcast, so we love to support them as well. If you are looking for a little bit of drink right now, as I think most of us are in this time, uh, it's a great way to not just support, but support local. You know that this money is going to people that are employing people in this local market, and uh Oh, you know, I just realized a little connection. I believe our next guest, one of our next guests, used to be an employee of Triangle Wine Company for a short while. Uh, we'll get to that in a quick moment. But to tee that up, our next guests, uh, you may recognize uh, one of them who has been on the show before. But we're talking about Postmaster. Postmaster opened to four stars by the NNO's Greg Cox just a little over two years ago as an upscale eatery in what was then a sleepy, sleepy suburb known as Cary. Now, too, along with other high quality re- restaurants, Postmaster faces new challenges to generate revenue during the quarantine. Their solution? A burger joint. And what better name but to take an old riff off an old phrase, government cheese, and turn it into government cheeseburger. The kids listening may not know what government cheese actually is. So to define, and I might be a little wrong in this, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but government cheese was a processed cheese provided for welfare welfare beneficiaries, food stamp recipients, and elderly living on Social Security in the United States, as well as food banks. It all started in about 1950 and ran through the 80s and was there to create, uh, to maintain the price of dairy during surpluses and dairy dairy subsidies, uh, the government would stockpile this like crazy processed cheese and use use it to distribute to victims during states of emergency. So, well named business, gents. We have the former guests of the show, Chef Chris Lopez, and General Manager Hayden Hall. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having us. Yeah. I saw what you guys were doing on Instagram, and I have yet to get a cheeseburger from y'all, but I need to get out there. Perhaps that, that might be one of our little uh, missions during this week to get outside and go do something, get a nice burger. But tell us, what, what was the impetus of this? How'd you guys get to this point of saying, let's just turn Postmaster into government cheeseburger? Uh, so we've actually been doing the... Uh House made American cheese for some time for our uh, burger features that we do every Thursday at Postmaster. Um, but you know, with all of this craziness that's going on, we tried for four or five days to do Postmaster food translated into to go. Um, and you know, that wasn't cutting it. Morale was super low. So myself and our sous chef, John Kleinert, uh, we're talking about just being greasy kids and doing a cheeseburger or a grilled cheese pop up. Uh, until two o'clock in the morning one night kept joking about it, joking about it, came up with the government cheese name for the grilled cheese pop-up. And then we were, we noticed that the, uh, the postmaster to go was trailing off a little bit. So we just said, fuck it. Let's, let's do the cheeseburgers. We, we know they're tried and true. They're R and D. They, they, they carry super easily. And, uh, you know, it's just the kind of shit people want right now. And so how's it been going so far? It's been crazy. The amount of love that people have shown for the community or from the community uh, has been awesome. When we first started, we were running a complete skeleton crew. We were selling out every single night. It was insane. You know, we were getting our asses kicked and we've gotten to the point where we've been able to bring back some kitchen staff and uh, extend our hours. So we went from just being four days a week, four to eight, to going five days a week, 12 days, which has been awesome to see that, you know, in this crazy time, we've been able to do something that just came up, kind of was a thing out of necessity and thrived a little bit. Yeah, it's been, uh, I guess, a month now, and it's cool to see we've had people come back six or seven times already. Mm-hmm. So that's the voice of Hayden, the general manager. Hayden, I did make a reference that you, uh, I think it was the first time we ever met, was that you were an employee at Triangle Wine Company sitting there slinging some uh, some tap beers behind the bar when we first met. Uh, but welcome to true, the show. That is true. First gig when I moved down to, uh, down to Raleigh. Yeah, you yourself, you have an interesting uh, path. You're from New York, but you, uh, I believe you also waited tables at Blackberry Farm, is that right? Out there in the uh, Smoky Mountains? From from Tennessee originally, uh, from East Tennessee. Oh, okay. Then uh, moved to Hudson Valley for about four years. Went to culinary school up there. Um, didn't wait tables at Blackberry, but I was uh, part of the the back of house staff at the barn, um, and I worked in the preservation kitchen there as well as uh, 
one of the cooler jobs I've had for sure. That is one of the most beautiful properties that I've ever had the luck of going to visit. The wine cellar down below with the tunnels and all. I mean, that is yeah. unbelievable. Andy, uh, Andy Shabbat, the, the beverage director there, uh, does, a, does an amazing job. So it's, it's a cool spot. Yeah. So how is this transitioning? You were all fancy schmancy, you know, working at cool places, but now you guys are slinging burgers. How is that just for the general feeling like this is not what you guys originally signed on to do, but what you're doing now, how does that feel for you guys? I think it's hilarious because there's at this point, there's not really any rules. I think we have a, a special coming up this week that is possibly the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, but I'm like, and I I've told Chris this, I think it's ridiculous. Um, but he wants to do a soft shell crab Frito pie. Yeah. And I love Frito pie. Uh, Petro's I'm from Tennessee and we have a thing called Petro's, which is like a, it's an entire restaurant based off Frito pies. So I love me some Frito pies, but I think that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, would you explain to this Los Angelino what a Frito pie is? Seriously. Yeah. So Frito pie is the base of it is Fritos. Um, and then it's topped with a chili, typically like cheese, sour cream, some chives, mm-hmm. and then sometimes you add a, a meat to it of some sort. Yeah. They're uh, usually served in the, in the Frito bag as well. You, you empty out all the Fritos, shove your chili, cheese, sour cream, and everything, and layer your Fritos in between all that shit, just eat it right out of the fucking bag. Apparently it's like a Texas and Tennessee. Are you guys going to serve it in Frito bags? Uh, the Frito bag will be there. However, um, the soft shell crabs are going to be a little bit big. Uh, so we are going to be serving them in the, uh, Hayden likes to call them chim- chimichanga trays. Uh, the, uh, the trays that you'd get uh, from takeout from a, me- a Mexican restaurant. Uh, so we've been, we've been serving all of our salads and such uh, like that out of those. So we're going to do the Frito pie out of those as well. <laughs> I'm sure Thomas Keller's uh, freaking out right now, knowing this is what's happening to soft shell crab. <laughs> well, it's funny that it's funny that you say that the idea that we um, to, to transition to a completely different model actually came from I was reading an article about a restaurant, I believe in Boston, that's like super fine dining, sit down, whole nine yards, and they're just slinging burgers, right, or not burgers, uh, bagels right now. And I was like, you know what? Like if 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 it works, it works. Um, but yeah, we're we're gonna do some uh, pretty shitty things um, with with the food, like soft shell crab, Frito pie. Uh, we're planning on doing a, a fillet of fish in a couple of weeks. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, just just kind of as Hayden said, there's no rules. I told my staff when they came back, if you have any dumb ideas, they are on the table. Let's fucking do it. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is the, this is the beauty of the and the true silver lining of stuff like this is want the no rules thing and you just get to get as creative as you want oh yeah and cook whatever the heck you want but also the cool thing is that as uh people who dine at postmasters or government cheese is we are going to once we get out of this go and appreciate those awesome creative juices Mm -hmm. flowing because i'm sure some of those things will now make it to the regular menu oh yeah they'll at least uh we'll at least draw some inspiration from them but yeah you know we talk about it we uh We've been treading lightly for the past two and a half years. We, we touched on it last time I was on the podcast that, you know, Carrie's kind of been a little bit of a, of a desert for restaurants of, you know, our style. And, um, it's been really cool to be a part of that and let be a part of that food community growing and changing, you know, along with like the Felicis and Bettinger from Sidebar, a lot of other great folk that we have in the area. And it's nice to not have to tread as lightly right now and be like, you know what? We're doing burgers. We're slinging whatever we want to sling. Uh, it works. It works. If it doesn't, it doesn't we figure something out at the end of the day. I love it. And a uh, little shout out to a local artist and also food and beverage person. Uh, I believe he's a bartender in the area. Taylor Holmes did the original artwork. Is that correct? Uh, so yeah, we actually, uh, I commissioned Taylor a few months ago to do a portrait of my animals, uh, our pets, uh, for my girlfriend's, uh, birthday and um we were talking about doing a barbecue pop-up over at postmaster and so i commissioned taylor again to do a portrait of myself and our sushi stuff john and um you know we we just had it locked and loaded waiting around for the barbecue event to come around and then this whole thing happened we were talking about a logo like doing a whole rebrand instead of just being like postmaster doing burgers and um it just fit in perfectly with the vibe the theme we've got merch that we're working on uh to try and you know bring in some revenue that way as well. Um, but it, you know, it's just been perfect. He's an incredibly talented dude and you know, we're, we're really happy that we get to, uh, get to promote him a little bit. So what is the percentage of 
you going back to Postmaster and not continue as government cheese <laughs> burger in the future? A hundred percent. We are all anticipating the day that we can, you know, go back to like being, you know, everybody that works in the kitchen signed on for the job because of Postmaster. They're happy, you know, to be there slinging burgers and, you know, doing what we're doing, happy to be doing what we're doing. But, you know, we all, we all miss the, the creative output that we had in a, uh, in a plated dish rather than something that just gets wrapped up in foil and basically thrown out the door. <laughs> well, right uh, maybe we have a nice uh, second restaurant potentially happening uh, for the for the gents at Postmaster. Looking forward, I know uh, Tyler, right? Like he he uh, he's always up for a challenge and, and always. Yeah, uh, we we're, we're we're looking keeping an eye on the numbers to see if it's a, a viable option down the line. Well, gents, we really appreciate you doing all this and doing what you do. Uh, it, I, again, it's it's that entrepreneurial spirit. It's also just creativity. You can't keep a creative person down for too long. And I love that you just decided to do it. And you're having fun while doing it, too. So uh, if you haven't started following, uh, what is it, at Gov... G O V T dot cheeseburger. Is that right? Yep. That's, that's the one We actually, we had somebody the other day, uh, ask us if we were huge, uh, Virginia tech fans. Cause they thought it was go Virginia tech cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. Like, n- sure. no, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, really niche market we're going after. Yeah. <laughs> he said, no, we're just really hokey. <laughs> oh geez. Uh, but thanks again, gents. Um, we appreciate it. And thanks a lot. Well, Thanks, guys. First, just want to give a shout out to Proof Alcohol Ice Cream. While you're in quarantine, it's a great thing to have in your freezer. As you know, it's dessert and your cocktail of choice all in one. Mm. And not only is it a great imbibing experience, but it's really good ice cream. It's creamy. It's delicious. They have great flavors. My personal favorite, as I've mentioned many times, is the apple pie moonshine oh, yeah. i know the bourbon caramel is very popular uh but you choose you can find it at triangle wine company or if you don't live near a triangle wine company you can get it at a harris teeter or lowe's you'll find it in the alcohol section uh there's the big red freezer that says proof alcohol ice cream think differently about dessert well matt that was uh this was fun I like this. Uh, I hope uh, listeners enjoyed this too, kind of going around the triangle. Maybe we can do this again going around the triad or going around Asheville or going around Wilmington or or whatever to see what everybody else is doing. So if you're listening to this and you want to be a part of some good news, then just shoot us a message, whether it's on Instagram at ncfbpod, uh, direct email to us, matt or max at ncfbpodcast.com. We'd love to hear it because I think everybody loves hearing some good news and figuring out a way to repurpose what you're already doing. So uh, who knows? Maybe you figured out a way to shift your model and maybe that's the new model you're going to do well into the future. Who knows? That's, uh, you know, in, in crisis lies opportunity. So let's seize the day, make it happen. Matt, what else you got? I just want to thank all the gentlemen for doing what you do coming on and telling your story and giving us some inspiration that not all is lost and businesses and people are going forward. And not only that, but in this time, we're helping some of those that are less fortunate. So thank you. And for all those out there, try to enjoy, do the cook along with Jacob Bohm, get yourself some Lawrence barbecue, go out there to Hawthorne and Wood, or if you're in Cary, get yourself some government cheese. You will eat and drink very merrily. For listening to the NCFB podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember five stars are encouraged.